Well, I'm kind of anxious to uh, to give this. I, I made a lot of the points in this. Uh, the presentation about uh, eight or nine years ago, and nobody ever wanted to listen to it. So now I got a captive audience to uh, put this together. What uh, I'm going to talk a little bit ab about equine herpes uh, myeloencephalopathy in context to disease management. Um, a lot of the slides in here are courtesy of those three gentlemen you see there: Dr. John George Allen, Dr. Peter Timothy, and uh, Dr. Udeni Balasarara. Uh, at the Gluck Center. Uh, Dr. Allen uh, did a lot of the research uh, that's, that's uh, quoted in here. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Allen uh, is no longer with us, so uh, uh, the continuation of that research has been somewhat disjointed. Uh, you'll see a lot of the slides uh, go back to 2006. I actually saw, I didn't realize it at the time, but saw the first case probably of of EHM back about 1979 in a thoroughbred stallion on one of the farms that, that we served. Um, it was quite a diagnostic exercise at that time trying to figure out what was going on. But uh, this is a kind of the way I approached uh, dealing with disease and, and much of this came out of an outbreak that we had in 2007 at, at Churchill Downs. Uh, and me trying to get my arms around what we should be doing in response to not only EHM but to any disease and try to make it generic. So I, you know, I, I, I wanted to develop a template uh, that was applicable and adaptable to all animal diseases, a, you know, a process uh, for information collection, communication, strategic development, and operational implementation. And this is kind of a forgotten slide in a way. Uh, back after 9-11, uh, 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 there was a lot of talk about agriterrorism and the processes we go through as far as awareness, prevention, preparedness, response, and recovery. Those things are all still applicable today. Uh, we don't talk about it in that frame a lot, but uh, still is a, is a way to think about it. So as far as uh, a mitigation template for any disease uh, has certain characteristics. Uh, being uh, the specific of, of that agent that we're dealing with, uh, the diagnosis of whatever disease we're talking about, uh, the prevention, uh, response, the process that we go through in, in dealing with it, uh, communication, how we get information out, uh, business continuity, and the tools that regulatory agencies need in dealing with this. So I'm going to aim a lot uh, of the discussion on the characteristics of uh, EHV1 and uh, some of the considerations that we have in applying this template to that. Uh, certainly you can see there are a whole list of things applicable to a particular organism that we're talking about. And how each one of those portrays itself is important, I think, to our response. So EHV1, some of the characteristics of it are uh, that it is endemic in the United States and, and literally worldwide. It is ubiquitous and it is everywhere. Uh, it three, has three forms that we commonly see, being the uh, respiratory form, which is probably the most common, the reproductive form, or more recently, a lot of emphasis on the neurologic form. Uh, typically, it has a two to eight day incubation period, but that is variable. Uh, subclinical infection is very common. Uh, currently, there are two strains that we recognize. One we call the wild strain, one we call the mutant or neuropathogenic strain. In uh, talking with Dr. Timoney last week, um, it's uh, a little interesting that the mutant strain may really have been the genesis for the wild strain. So we don't know which, which one really was the chicken or the egg. Uh, but I think uh, with the advent of PCR and the recognition of, of the two different strains, uh, these terminologies have kind of become uh, universal. There's a similar range of exp expression in, in both virus uh, variations, uh, but there is certainly a difference in virulence, uh, and both do cause latent infection. Latency is, a, is an interesting concept uh, with this virus. Uh, uh, 
looks like 40 to 60 percent of the population has a degree of latency uh, in the brain. Uh, they are long, lifelong carriers. Uh, they do not shed virus during latency. Recrudescence is commonly the initiating source of virus in an outbreak. Um, a lot of times we look for that index horse and where that index horse may have been in tracing back to decide uh, where that disease came from. I, for, I personally believe most of it is recrudescence and not from a single source. Uh, stress certainly plays a role in recrudescence, but I don't think we really understand recrudescence very well. Uh, seemingly a lot of the horses that present as the NCAX case um, have no greater stress than a lot of the cohorts. So. That role is, is controversial to some degree. I made this analogy, which makes sense to me. Some learned people didn't think it was valid, uh, but I think uh, there is a correlation between uh, herpes in humans and herpes in horses in that uh, chicken pox latency results in shingles, and a person with shingles actually can give another person chicken pox. Uh, and certainly we see with the HV1 latency that that can be expressed, uh, the exposure of a different horse can be expressed in either respiratory, reproductive, or neurologic form, and that certainly, obviously, is communicable to a wide range of susceptible hosts. <coughs> this is uh, some of Dr. Allen's work, and you can see he, uh, <coughs> he tried to compare uh, the difference between the wild strain and, and the mutant strain as far as uh, incidence of latency in thoroughbred mares, and 46%, uh, no surprise, were wild strain, and a smaller percentage, eight, uh, were with a mutant strain. This was obviously done some years ago, but I don't think we'd see a lot of difference today. Uh, this is an excellent slide that is very complex, and in Dr. Timoney's presentation, it is actually, actually a progressive slide that makes it a lot easier to follow. Uh, but it just kind of goes through the life cycle of EHV1 and shows the many ways that it can be expressed uh, within the infection and within a population. To me, this is kind of the granddaddy of all the slides that Dr. Allen uh, has provided today. Uh, this just, and it, this was, is in foals, and we're making, I'm making some, some maybe wide uh, assumptions here that it is valid in adult horses, but it's, it does show the difference, I think, in the virulence of the, uh, the wild strain versus the mutant strain. Uh, we see a, a shorter incubation period uh, with the mutant strain, a much, much higher uh, level of viremia, and a somewhat prolonged level of viremia and shedding. So uh, I think this gives us an idea of why uh, EHM uh, from the mutant strain is, uh, is seen more often today and is, is much more important as far as uh, uh, disease in the horse. The relationship uh, between neurologic disease and the two strains, I think we've, we've talked about some, but in this experiment there were 20, 24 horses inoculated by Dr. Allen. And you can see in that wild strain, he did not get any horses with neurological disease, but with the mutant strain, uh, two-thirds of them did show neurologic signs. And again, uh, just showing the, in the number of outbreaks that have been attributed to one or the other, and it's, uh, in this case, 24 to 2 with the mutant strain winning. Uh, but I think the point is that wild strain can cause uh, neurologic signs also, uh, and we can't just assume necessarily that it is mutant strain. In the diagnosis of it, uh, the ability for PCR to differentiate, differentiate between the two has been important, I think, to us. Threshold of infectivity is uh, also something that came out of that original discussion. Uh, the presence of the virus does not necessarily equate to disease. I think that's important to recognize uh, when we talk about surveillance. Uh, we do not routinely recommend going through a population of horses and testing them because you will find positive horses. That does not mean that you have disease. It does not mean that those horses are necessarily infective. Uh, the volume of the disease shed varies with the stage of infection and a low level of virus uh, present uh, certainly 
has the potential to cause disease, but many times does not. I think the stabling environment plays a huge role uh, in the concentration and the circulation of virus. Uh, stress level certainly does. And probably as important as anything is the population susceptibility, whether that be the age of the animals uh, or the vaccination status or both. Immunity uh, to this virus is, uh, is kind of waning, uh, whether it be from uh, exposure uh, or from passive antibody in the fall uh, or from vaccination. Uh, certainly uh, our goal for vaccination would be for prevention of disease, but uh, I don't think any of the viruses totally give us that, or any of the vaccines totally give us that. I think there is the ability to mitigate the severity of disease and the incidence of disease. Uh, although efficacy uh, is, is variable. There are several different kinds of vaccines available on the commercial market, whether they be modified live or killed. Important to remember, I think, that none of these are labeled uh, for the mutant strain. Uh, none of them are labeled for neurologic disease. And the, uh, the dosage schedule as far as uh, vaccination uh, varies. And it's interesting to me, uh, the original vaccine that was developed at UK back in the 50s uh, for abortion uh, was on a 579 schedule for a reason. Uh, that seemed to be the time that the virus was recognized in the uterus and, and was a risk to the marrow to abort. And to this day, uh, for some strange reason, we still think that's the schedule it ought to be. And it really isn't. Uh, the modified live vaccine that I used a lot in practice and believed to be effective uh, was uh, commonly given at 60-day intervals. Uh, it's one of those things I guess we think a little, if a little bit's good, a whole lot's better, when it seems uh, that's exactly the opposite, uh, that we can give a vaccine too often. I think kind of the rule of thumb today for that vaccine is probably every 90 days. I understand when the vaccine was actually developed, it was to be every 60 day or every uh, six months. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of things we don't know about vaccines and exactly how they're applicable to this disease. Dr. Allen did some uh, experiments with a live virus vaccine, and uh, I think he did demonstrate that it was effective. Uh, he, again, used 24 horses, uh, vaccinated uh, 12 of them and didn't 12. And you can see the difference there. He had one neurologic case in the vaccinated animals after exposure and uh, eight of the non-vaccinated uh, animals that were exposed to the mutant strain did develop neurologic signs. I uh, don't know uh, what the status within the commercial industry for a, a vaccine for EHM is. Um, it would be a popular vaccine, I think, today in the horse industry, uh, but I don't know that one is, is in the offing very soon. Diagnosis is obviously an important thing, and I think uh, we need to consider the differentials when a veterinarian sees a neurologic horse, and there are certainly several. Uh, the laboratory testing, all those things play into any response. The tests that are available to diagnose that disease and where it is, what the sample is, how quickly you can get it, what the cost of it is, and interpretation. Uh, I very much believe that uh, we shouldn't make uh, clinical diagnosis totally based on laboratory tests. Um, we have to look at the whole picture. But for us, uh, the uh, case definition includes neurologic signs and a positive PCR. Uh, and some of those signs I think we're pretty familiar with. Uh, it's a rapidly uh, progressing a neurologic disease, maybe uh, preceded by fever in some cases. The, the severity of it can be variable. Uh, many different manifestations, whether it's uh, incoordination, uh, bladder apnea, various things can, can all be demonstrated. Many times those cases end up in a recumbent horse that then is euthanized. We've been uh, dependent on PCR, uh, using both nasal swab and whole blood. And uh, I really, I, I can't, don't have the time uh, to get into the particulars of this, but uh, you can see you can get different combinations of positive and negatives within these two different tests. And we do use that uh, to in evaluate both uh, 
individual status, uh, population status of a particular barn or facility, and use it as a baseline for the outbreak. And in many cases, it guides the response that we have and uh, certainly an exit stat strategy where we think it's safe to remove the quarantine. Uh, prevention being the goal, uh, as I said, surveillance testing, to my mind, is of questionable value. Uh, serology especially would demonstrate a very, very wide exposure of disease or vaccination within the horse population. Uh, vector elimination uh, is not going to happen, but we, I think we can decrease the concentration and the exposure. Uh, segregation of horses uh, certainly makes a lot of sense, especially if you're in the show arena. And we've talked a lot about in all the other discussions uh, this morning about education and biosecurity in that role. I do have a few magazines up here uh, that the, the company was nice enough to provide. I don't have enough for everybody, so if you're a horse person, you might want to get one uh, about uh, show, horse show biosecurity and things that an owner can do. Uh, the lady, I think, did a pretty good job with the, uh, with the article. So response to an outbreak, uh, certainly uh, early detection is imperative. And I, I use these three particular terms uh, with a, a very distinct uh, definition. And to me, removing the index animal, isolation of that animal uh, from the population is the first and maybe the most important thing that we can do initially. Uh, segregation uh, means compartmentalization of animals into like groups. Um, I think that helps us to be able to respond uh, to the outbreak in a way that allows uh, people to get back to normal quicker. If we can, uh, we commonly will test uh, at seven day intervals to put horses in like groups. And quarantine to me means the placement of specific restrictions on either a premises or a group of animals uh, by the officially authorized agency. Biosecurity, as we've heard over and over at this meeting, is, should be routine and practiced by everybody all the time. Uh, horse people probably uh, don't want to understand that. It is, at the very least, Katie, inconvenient, uh, maybe if it's not expensive, but it's expensive if you get the result from it. Vaccination is controversial. Um, we do have on our racetracks a directive uh, that horses have to be vaccinated within six months to enter the grounds. Um, <clears throat> I understand that uh, vaccine is not effective against uh, the mutant strain. It's not effective supposedly against neurologic disease. Uh, I happen to think that some effort is good, whether it's uh, totally effective or not. So. Uh, our industry, especially the racing industry, has bought into that. I guess my greatest fear is not having it in the, the racing industry where they're somewhat of a controllable population, but rather in the show industry uh, where at our uh, fairgrounds in, in Louisville uh, in August we may have as many as 1,200 horses on the grounds at one time. And if we have an EHV outbreak there, they can't stay there. And so I don't know where they're going to go. But uh, hopefully, uh, Tony, you and the other state veterinarians uh, will allow them to go home, maybe under quarantine. <laughs> but they're not staying in Kentucky. Uh, movement restriction, obviously, is one of the tools that is uh, effective in dealing with any kind of a disease outbreak. Uh, uh, the traceability aspect of, of herpes is... Uh, has some value, but I don't think it's a, it's a total persona either. Um, and there are some therapies that are used in the case of the clinical horse. Let's go through this rather quickly, but this is part of the, the overall template of uh, deciding what was going to happen and, and the authority uh, of an agency to implement uh, these kinds of strategies is important. You need to know who's going to do what, uh, look at intervention points, uh, I, firewalls are important. I like checklists to see that people are doing the things as they need to do it. You got to have contingency planning because things don't always go according to plan. Fiscal responsibility. Decide it going in. Who's going to pay for the testing? Uh, we had a strangles outbreak at Churchill Downs. Uh, we didn't make that totally clear because the racetrack very generously uh, said they would pay for the first round of testing. 
uh, it was in, understood in my mind that the trainer and the owner of the horses uh, would be responsible for the continued testing. Uh, that didn't happen. And uh, a vet clinic probably wasn't happy with me because they got stuck for about $10,000 in bills. So uh, probably good to have a contract with the people uh, before you uh, get too far into it. Uh, resource management, always important, a uh, whole list of people that we need, uh, we need to be talking to there. Not the least of which is the security staff. Uh, that again at Churchill, when we had the outbreak there, uh, they had uh, they had guards, if you will, at all of the barns, uh, telling people where they could go and where they couldn't go. Uh, we had it at Turfway, and again we had people in the barns uh, making sure that the biosecurity was met. It's key to a response. Without it, uh, you're going to have breaks uh, because people just don't understand or they get careless. Communication is a huge key. Uh, it begins with awareness and awareness of all the stakeholders. Um, veterinarians and the facility management uh, are, are keys to that. We can't assume that everybody knows what we're trying to accomplish. We can't assume that they understand the severity of this. So um, awareness is extremely important. Information clearinghouse uh, coming either from the, the agency or from the newly formed uh, Equine Disease Communication Center. Um, we will uh, supply the information that we want at the center uh, from my office. Uh, from my equine management manager, uh, Rusty Ford, does a great job of communicating, and we want our information out, so we will be working with the, the EDDC to get that information out. Uh, Public and social media is important. Uh, because horses are important in Kentucky, the newspapers are interested in welfare issues. They're interested in disease outbreaks. Uh, things go viral very quickly in the social media. Um, we had a case uh, last summer where something went out on Facebook uh, that there was an outbreak at a stable, which there wasn't. Uh, but within 24 hours, everybody in the world thought we, we were going to shut down everything in Lexington because of an EHV outbreak. Uh, business continuity certainly is our goal. Uh, I think there's a difference between response and reaction. To me, response indicates you've planned, you know what you're going to do. Reaction is knee-jerk, uh, where you may make wrong decisions. Uh, risk versus benefit. If you're going to cancel the show, uh, do it for the right reasons, that the risk warrants that. Realize we can't mitigate all risk. Uh, cost versus science. Uh, there's a lot of people that would rather use time because it's cheaper than they would use science. In other words, they're not going to test their horses necessarily. We're going to go for a 21 or 28-day quarantine with no symptoms, uh, which is, is standard and, and, quite frankly, appropriate within many uh, populations of horses. And very important to know uh, what your exit strategy is. Uh, uh, one thing I learned very early in this job was when you put a quarantine on, know what you're going to do to take it off. When is that criteria met? There are certain tools that uh, state animal health officials need uh, from their legislature, like statutes and regulations. Uh, we try to develop protocols and SOPs to get down into the details of, of what we're trying to accomplish with, with the response. So in summary, uh, kind of common sense things, but uh, recognize the threat and the risk assess that situation, develop a strategy, mitigate the risk, and try to get back to normal as soon as possible. Uh, some key points uh, from Dr. Timoney's slides. Uh, we've, we've talked about EHV uh, presenting itself in the different ways, whether it's respiratory, abortion, or neurologic disease. Uh, both of these viruses are ubiquitous in the equine populations worldwide. So it's out there, and we can't we can't do anything about that. We just have to deal with the, the game that we have. Um, generally, the spread is usually through uh, respiratory contact. Um, vast majority of the neuropathogenic cases are uh, from the mutant strain. Um, both viruses have a latency uh, and a carrier state that is that is lifelong. So. Immunity is waning uh, and short-lived in mo most cases. Uh, 
Prevention of these diseases uh, requires sound management, both at the individual horse owner level and at the management and the facility level. And vaccines do uh, confer some, but not absolute protection against these diseases. And just recent outbreaks and recent is relative. Uh, you can see it goes back all the way to 1970, and this is some of Dr. Allen's work. Uh, pretty rare uh, through the 90s up to 2000, and in 2000 to 2006, you can see 24 cases. <coughs> and I suspect, Katie, if we updated that today, we would probably see uh, double that uh, since then. So. Uh, certainly it is, Carla, an emerging disease, uh, even though it may be a very old emerging disease. So, 